The Welsh county of Pembrokeshire has a wide and weird history of extraterrestrial visitation. In 1977, the Coombs family, as well as many others in the St. Brides Bay area, reported witnessing and indeed interacting with strange space-suited figures. There were also claims of UFOs, ET haunted schools, livestock teleportations, and even alien abduction. In time, the reports died down, and yet it cannot be said that the strangeness ever really left the area. After all, odd sightings continued, with Milford Haven and Pembroke Dock seated on opposite sides of the estuary, the former a mere seven miles as the crow flies from the E.T. synonymous St. Bright's, attracting numerous reports of UFOs and other odd happenings over the years. As recently as February 2022, a peculiar blue object was seen and photographed several hundred feet up in the air above the Pembroke refinery from Milford Haven. Then, a few years earlier in 2009, there were countless sightings of similar unidentified flying objects, with it even reported that over 20 witnesses at Pembroke Docks Hobbs Point saw an unusual orange ball navigating the estuary. This orange ball, described as a large, fiery mass in other sightings, was also seen by a woman known as Susan. Unlike many others who witnessed the same phenomenon, she was not left in awe or desirous to find out more about what she had seen. Rather, she was terrified. After all, that evening, sitting in her boyfriend's car, eating fast food whilst looking out over the estuary from Hobbs Point, had been arranged to serve as a distraction from the other strange and horrifying things slowly devouring her life. For indeed, only three days prior, Susan had encountered an alien being, a tall, black, skinny figure that woke her in the early hours of the morning, abducted her, and even so she claimed, killed, then stole the corpse of her friend's dog. The orange ball of fire was, so she thought, connected and, along with other horrific incidents, would continue to plague her for the next several years, ultimately leading her to conclude that humankind is slowly being harvested by a monstrous, careless, unceasing alien race. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Autumn undoubtedly marks the start of the spooky season, and if you're on my channel, you no doubt love a good scare. And yet, not every fright is a delight. For example, the wine aisle, that overwhelming and fear-inducing corridor of snobbery and specialist knowledge. And so, before we dive too deep into this case, please allow a brief moment for me to discuss the sponsor of this video, Bright Sellers. The wine aisle is scary, Bright Cellars isn't. With their seven question quiz and algorithm designed to match your taste preferences with the perfect bottle, Bright Cellars subscription delivery box brings the joy of wine straight to your door. By focusing on hidden gems from small vineyards all across the globe, you'll be sipping on the very best Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir and Rioja in no time at all, all from the comfort of your home. You can rate your wines to improve your future matches, and with each box guaranteed to delight, even request a replacement from Bright Sellers if there's a bottle you didn't like. You can also skip or cancel any time. It's wonderful wine your way. Not only that, each box comes with wine education cards to help you learn about your bottles. So if you're planning a spooky get-together with friends this Halloween, why not dazzle them with your sophistication and intellect as you indulge in a full and complex Italian red? Or, if it's your preference, a fresh and fruity Californian white. Truly a world-class experience, all without a world-class price. Bright Sellers are currently giving my followers their first six-bottle subscription box, usually over $150 for only $55. Simply click the link in the description box to take the quiz and get started today. During October, you can also add a sip or treat to your box. This means when you get your box in the month of October, you'll receive either an extra sip, a bottle of wine picked by Bright Sellers just for you, or a treat, a fun merch item such as a notebook, corkscrew, or champagne pain stopper. Thank you again to Bright Sellers for once again supporting my work on this channel. Now, on with the video. Susan's story truly begins with G. L. Davies, a Pembrokeshire native born in 1975 with a lifelong interest in the paranormal. 
the author of several best-selling books discussing local hauntings. He, in 2014, decided to turn his eye to the UFO phenomenon, specifically in regards to the aforementioned 1970s West Wales flap. Hoping to get in contact with anyone who could remember the original happenings, he was surprised when Susan, a woman in her mid-twenties who was not old enough to fit this requirement, responded to his advertisement. Regardless, he agreed to meet with her, hoping she would lead him to an older relative or neighbour with a story to tell. And yet, sitting in an idyllic riverside coffee shop in Haverford West, Davies soon realised it was her own story that she had come to share. She was, so she claimed, the victim of something much more recent, and in many ways, much more sinister than anything that had happened in the 70s. And so, changing course, Davies decided to pursue Susan's dark and terrible story, a decision which, in October 2014, took him to her home for what would be the first of many interviews, which he would ultimately publish in his true story book, Harvest. It was November, over five years ago, Susan is said to have told the author. A student at university, living with her aunt, she happily agreed to spend the night with three friends for movies and a few bottles of Rioja out in the countryside. Her friend's parents were away on holiday, and so they had the old stone farmhouse all to themselves. Four young women, her friend's dog Lenny, and plenty of girlish chatter. At some point in the night, Susan went upstairs to use the bathroom. As she did, she noticed through the skylight what appeared to be the headlights of a car coming down the long and bumpy track which led to the farmhouse. Watching the lights through the window, she saw them stop and then, oddly, turn off. At the very same moment, the light in the bathroom is also said to have gone off. Outside the door, she could hear the dog barking and her friends moving and shouting all the power in the house having gone out. Susan hurried to finish in the dark, and yet, before she was able to do so, a bright white light is said to have appeared, suddenly and fiercely from above through the skylight. Indeed, it was so bright that she claimed to have had to cover her eyes. Presuming it to be a helicopter, perhaps one investigating the source of the power cut, she thought little of it. That was until she went downstairs and her friends asked her if she was okay. She had been in the bathroom for 15 minutes. Susan, however, was adamant she had only taken five at the very maximum. Upon checking her mobile phone for the time, she found it was turned off. Indeed, all four of the young women's phones had, alongside the electricity, turned off. Even so, Susan was quick to dismiss the oddity. The power and the phones were turned back on, no car ever arrived along the long rural driveway, and the girls enjoyed the rest of their evening. They went to bed around 2am. It was decided that Susan would sleep in the converted barn for the night, only a few footsteps from the main farmhouse, with Lenny the dog for company. Like the farmhouse, the building had skylights, and so she settled into the warmth of the barn apartment, poured herself a tall glass of water for her bedside table, and went to sleep. According to the testimony recorded by G. L. Davies, she woke at 3.18 am. There was, she claimed, someone else in the room with her. Lenny the dog was fast asleep on the bed, and yet, beyond, at the foot of it, she could sense someone stood there in the darkness. She had not heard, for example, one of her friends come in the front door and up the stairs. Rather, she had simply woken and felt as though someone was already in the room with her. I thought I could make out something moving, she explained to the author. It was something small, almost as though there was a child, slender, three feet tall, watching her in the dark as she slept. Panicking, Susan then described sitting up, at which point a bright white light filled the room. It was the same as the light she had experienced in the bathroom earlier in the evening, and caused her friend's dog to wake and jump off the bed. The animal was barking, clearly also sensing the strange figure in the room. Things were being knocked over, and all Susan could focus on was an intense pain in her head. Then, there was a blue, smoky flash which momentarily illuminated the room. In that second of light, she allegedly saw the dog attacking a tall, black, skinny figure. A second flash, a high-pitched ringing, a howl of pain, and finally, an inhuman scream, then she saw the dog again. 
this time crumpled as a motionless heap on the floor. Another flash and he was gone. When the final blue flash came, Susan screamed. The figure was mere inches from her, its black, featureless face very almost touching hers. After that, she must have, somehow, fallen back asleep, for the next she remembered she was waking up again. It was quarter to eight in the morning, and she felt terrible. Her head hurt, she had a pain behind her right eye, cramps in her stomach, and a sharp, piercing pain in the back. The nightmare, at least, was over. And yet, when she looked for Lenny the dog, she couldn't find him. He was missing, and despite her and her friends searching the entire farm for him, he was never seen again. And so it was that Susan sat in her apartment with the author G. L. Davies, is said to have claimed that some manner of faceless being had killed her friend's dog, the animal having rushed to protect her and his home from the insidious, intruding figure. She of course had no proof, and indeed spoke of how her friends drifted away from her in the aftermath of this incident, quietly believing that Susan, through drunken carelessness, had somehow lost her friend's beloved family pet. And certainly, maybe the young woman would have come to convince herself of this too, if it had not been for all that happened next. Unable to shake what happened that night, Susan's health, mental and physical, began to decline rapidly. Describing herself as incredibly ill, she suffered nosebleeds, a continuation of the pain behind her eye, stomach cramps and bowel problems. Debilitated and depressed, it was as though she were in the grip of some terrible drug. Her doctor suggested she might have an iron deficiency, and yet supplements did little to help. Above all, however, she feared going to sleep. What if the haunting dream sequence returned? And so, wanting to take her mind off it, she arranged to go on a date with a young man she was seeing at the time. That evening, they bought fast food and drove to Pembroke Dock, specifically a little car park called Hobbs Point. There, they could sit in the car and eat, watching the estuary and the lights of the boats bobbing in the water, the Pembroke oil refinery and its lights in the distance. It was that evening that Susan, along with her date, saw the anomalous bright orange light. At first distant, it is said to have grown bigger and bigger until it became clear to both Susan and her boyfriend that it was on course to collide with the car. Describing its appearance, Susan said it seemed almost to be a flame, like it was a ball of fire trapped in a glass ball. There was static electricity in the air inside the car, and then, just before impact, the ball of light suddenly came to a standstill. It hovered over the car, then shot off at great speed down the estuary towards the bridge. The encounter only lasted a few seconds, and yet it was so bizarre and frightening that it put an end to Susan's night. Thoroughly horrified, she went home. Using the information provided in the book, Susan's sighting appears to date to November 2008. According to the author, there were other sightings of unusual activity on the estuary that night. In the aftermath of that odd happening, Susan's health is said to have continued to decline. Living with her aunt, due to her useful proximity to both Susan's university and part-time job, she suffered largely in silence, her friends and now boyfriend distanced from her. Not only that, she began to suffer terrible nightmares. In G. Al Davis' book, Susan's nightmares are described in great detail. In particular, she claimed to have had three terrible nights, each with a terrible dream. She would find herself walking along the high street of Haverford West, the town in which she and her aunt lived together. Drawn to a particular pub, she would enter each time and converse with various people, including, she claims, a younger incarnation of herself. She would be asked questions, some of them eerie, including if she had a baby, would she love it more than her own life, and whether or not she would kill a man to protect herself. Most chillingly, however, when Susan awoke from these dreams, she would be in agony. She had awful pains in her stomach and an excruciating headache. The first night when she rose from bed to use the bathroom, she even alleged that she encountered a skinny, faceless black figure. It touched the side of her head with a black, metal, claw-like hand, at which point she screamed and blacked out. The Shadow Man was gone when she next awoke. 
That night, she claimed she slept for 13 hours, and yet woke utterly exhausted. The second night, however, is said to have been the worst. After she woke, at first unable to move, with what she said was a huge pressure on her chest, Susan looked through her open bedroom door and across the hallway to her aunt's room. She was asleep in bed, her pet cat likewise resting. There was also, so Susan has claimed, a third figure in the room. Some manner of large, bulbous, transparent mass, somewhat akin to a jellyfish with lights in its body flashing reds, yellows, and blues. It was supported by incredibly thin, segmented legs, like the legs of an insect, and stood on top of Susan's aunt. When it got close to her face, it is reported to have touched her. Two long, thin, vein-like tendrils emerging from the area where its head should have been, so as to enter the sleeping woman's nose. The other moved to the sleeping cat, lifting it into the air. The tendril had entered the animal's mouth. According to Susan, the feline did not wake during the nighttime violation. Her aunt, however, did. She screamed, and then Susan could remember no more. The next morning, she claimed both her aunt and the cat were tremendously ill, with the animal tragically passing the next day. And so, according to the young woman, her odd, night-creeping creatures had taken a second animal victim. A chilling and sensational claim indeed. And so, at this point in the story, it should be said that much of what is asserted in G. L. Davies' book comes only from his anonymous interviews with the young woman he refers to as Susan, and that even then, a large part of her testimony is drawn from dream scenes and solitary experiences. Naturally, this is problematic in terms of verification. How do we know the cat's death was caused by some manner of sinister alien interaction? We do not have a body. We do not even have a video or photograph. And so, we simply do not know. Of course, according to Davies, Susan was a highly articulate, sober and intelligent young woman. He got the sense that she very much believed and was still deeply traumatized by the events she relayed to him. These were memories and not made up. Regardless, it may be more usual in cases such as this to disregard the story altogether. How can any serious researcher be so generous as to entertain something with little to no backing? And yet, this story, and the book in which it has been published, has been widely read and accepted by the UFO community. Many believe there is something to it, and that Susan's story still has a value. After all, some of the details she is said to have shared with Davies have been reported in other, better documented cases. Discussing her nightmares, she explained to the author that, at the end of the dreams, she found herself in a cinema, unable to move, forced to watch a series of disturbing clips. First, she had seen insects devouring each other in graphic detail. On another occasion, the videos had been of the local area, and people dying in a disaster. Horrific, elongated scenes of a man melting like wax, and an elderly woman screaming as her car smashed into other cars on the road, as all around there were explosions. Broken buildings, wreckage, devastating disaster. Mothers and their children consumed by fire, and there were parts of people scattered across the screen. Intriguingly, similar scenes of disaster have been reported by other alleged alien abductees. And so, is there a link here which supports Susan's story? Perhaps. It can also be said to be interesting how Susan allegedly discovered, as the film continued, the cause of the disaster. The oil refinery situated on the Pembrokeshire coast, visible from the estuary and its towns. It had, she concluded, exploded making her wonder whether or not her experience was some manner of premonition, a warning of dark days to come. Strangely, the refinery and the estuary are places where many have witnessed UFOs, including Susan's orange ball of fire and the blue object photographed in 2022. Not only that, two and a half years after Susan's disturbing dream, an explosion at the refinery claimed the lives of four workers. By no means the scale of the scenes reported by Susan, but still, quite possibly, supportive of its disastrous potential. 
And so, if Susan's story had ended here, we might find ourselves left with a sensational but still somewhat compelling case. However, it does not. Instead, the three dream sequence can be said to signal a watershed, after which this case goes far beyond the usual in regards to alien abduction. Now, supposedly having been interviewed by the author over a series of days, Susan describes moving back to live with her parents after her aunt fell ill. The nightmares, as well as physical symptoms, are said to have continued, with her doctor unable to offer any sort of explanation beyond an iron deficiency. Meanwhile, her aunt, at a distance, continued to decline, with both women becoming more and more socially withdrawn. Before too long, her aunt, like the dog and cat before her, died, her body riddled with sudden and aggressive cancer. Presumably, her nighttime interaction with the jellyfish alien was to blame. As for Susan, she suffered further nightmares, including those in which she found herself in a field with other women, young and old, all of them naked and entranced as they walked together like a herd of cattle towards an intense red light. Whenever she would wake up, she would be, so she explained, oddly calm, like she had been sedated. Then, one evening when driving home, she experienced the nightmare again. Only this time, it wasn't actually a nightmare. Forced to break when she encountered a fox standing in the middle of the road, Susan next remembered stepping out of some woodland, the sky above her red. It was vivid, not a dream, but real, and she was naked and confused. She thought maybe she had been in a car accident, and so hurried through the night, scrambling up a hill in search of the road and her car. Instead, she found a field of tall grass and other naked women. Just as confused as she was, they supposedly came together and formed a group. An older lady, an elderly lady, a blind German woman, and even a little girl no more than five or six, whom Susan carried through the grass. This was very real, she told her interviewer. Although the situations and locations were the same as the dreams, this experience was said to have been intensely different. And so, she claimed, she and the others walked across the field together, under the red glow of the sky and an unseen light source. As they moved towards the horizon, panic supposedly set in. There were, so Susan said, women being sucked into the sky, rising and spinning, being abducted up into an unseen craft. There was blackness, and then Susan found herself in a large room. There were innumerable naked women around her, in dozens of single-file lines being, what can only be described as, processed by alien beings. Despite wanting to run, she was unable. Susan also, so she told the author, found that she couldn't speak. Her mouth had been taped up with a skin-coloured plastic that did not have an overlap, but was, instead, part of her face, inserted into her very skin to keep her quiet as she was violated in unimaginably horrific ways on board an extraterrestrial spacecraft, alongside thousands of other women. Here, G. R. Davies' book goes into a lot of detail regarding Susan's experiences, with her story presented as a straight testimony. In short, she was violated in a quasi-medical manner amidst a sea of gore, human remains and bodily waste stuck on a conveyor belt as part of a herd. Older women would be plucked from above, something attaching to their heads, snatching them away to be disposed of and processed elsewhere on the ship. Younger women, including herself, would have needles and pipes inserted into their bodies so as to be scraped and sucked out and then the fertile ones would be exposed to what she said were half-men, the bottom halves of male bodies kept alive by pipes and wires for the purpose of forced procreation. All on a conveyor belt, all in a factory setting, blood and guts and bits of human bodies minced and splattered everywhere around. The offspring from these unions, Susan explained, were taken from birthing mothers as the same bulbous jellyfish creatures she had seen on top of her aunt all those nights before swarmed over them. The babies were then either consumed or given over to faceless black figures she called overseers. She did not know what their purpose was. 
At the end of Susan's experience, she is said to have woken, still naked, in a field only a short distance from her car. Her clothes were supposedly bundled by its door. When she returned to it, she realized she was on a track road by a woodland. She did not remember driving there, and so she is said to have dressed and driven home, utterly confused, utterly terrified. Undoubtedly, all of this is tremendously difficult to believe. It sounds like the product of an unwell mind, a fever dream, and yet it is alleged to be true. Not only that, Susan, through her interviews with Davies, claims she feels it is her mission, her vital duty, to share her experiences so that so many women around the world can come to understand why they awake each morning with stomach cramps, pains behind their eyes, sickness, diarrhea, strange dreams and visions, and paranoia. And, of course, also to explain why so, so many women, even pregnant women, go missing. Truly noble purposes, and yet ones which, like much else in this story, make little to no sense. After all, if what is reported in this case does actually represent reality, then why not speak out publicly? If there is so much at stake, why hide behind a pseudonym? Especially as, as the end of the book makes clear, Susan has no desire to live or eke out any sort of meaningful human existence in the aftermath of her abductions. Then there are the claims of mass female unexplained illness and disappearances, both of which are presented as solid facts by Susan and the author. And yet, I am uncertain as to how either of these statements are true. Considering the latter, it is difficult to find documentary evidence to support thousands of women being abducted each night, with many never making the journey home after they are either disposed of for being too old or forced to give birth and then be consumed by jellyfish alien beings. For example, in the UK, where this case originates, although there are over 320,000 people reported missing every year, 87% of those are found within two days. Less than 1%, 3,200 people, are missing for longer than a month. And even then, as of March 2022, there are only 5,200 long-term missing individuals in the UK. Now, that is not to diminish these cases at all. Each and every one of those 5,200 people is a tragedy and a heartache for the people who love them. But we must not distort this pain by claiming that there is a constant black hole of missing people that can be explained by the sort of industrial abduction scenario presented by G. L. Davies's book. It is simply unsupportable. Perhaps this condemnation seems harsh, but I would argue that we are duty-bound to attempt to unpick what has been alleged in any and all cases of the extraordinary, to investigate and to challenge, and not just accept. After all, it is necessary to point out a case's flaws in order to protect and preserve the reputation of more compelling, better documented cases of alien encounter and abduction. This is all the more important when a case has been accepted by many as true, as is seen in regards to this one when one consults reviews left on websites including Goodreads and Amazon. For indeed, Susan's story is not an impenetrable narrative. In fact, it is ridiculously flawed. Aside from the obvious issues regarding her identity, the lack of supporting evidence and unsupportable statistics, the long abduction scene comes across as a grotesquely idiotic circus that makes no sense given that the alien beings are described as advanced within the same book. Susan's limb-littered factory is far from the smooth and sterile laboratories usually described by abductees. For example, why do her aliens have need of odd biological half-men when they could more efficiently artificially inseminate their human cattle? After all, a rural dairy farmer can easily do so much. Why do these so-called technologically advanced beings seem more backward than the humans they are overlording? Do they merely enjoy the circus? It may be so, but it makes no sense. There are also inconsistencies. For example, how was Susan both mute and sedated and, as is described later in the book, screaming and ultimately able to remember her experiences? 
In other cases, abductees suffer arduous and traumatic psychiatric and hypnotic regression sessions in order to first uncover and then come to terms with their experiences. In this case, there was none of that. Rather, it very much seems like Susan one day decided to remember and then go off and find someone to have a chat with about it. In addition, it must also be said that this story in many ways reads as some manner of melange of the original 1970s West Wales UFO flap and scenes from popular horror and science fiction movies. We see Lenny the dog barking and terrified of an alien intruder, losing his life similar to how the Coombs family's Labrador Blackie was said to have been driven insane and ultimately euthanized after encountering a similarly featureless spaceman in the window of his family's home in 1977. Then we have scenes that can be said to be comparative to Hollywood films. The face tape over the mouth is reminiscent of Neo in The Matrix and his fight against the antagonist alien-esque agents. Likewise, the red and gory mints of human remains inside the alien craft is similar to the 2005 incarnation of War of the Worlds and the stringy red gore found throughout that film in relation to the alien tripods. We can cite Cloud Atlas and the factory scene there, where women are discarded and processed in a similarly inhumane manner. I am certain the list could continue. Here, it is also interesting to note that, throughout Davies' book on this case, Susan is painted as a sci-fi fan, with Richard Matheson's classic book I Am Legend on her bookcase and Blade Runner cited as one of her favourite movies. During her interview, she even directly references The Matrix. All of this does little to convince the reader of the case's genuineness. With this in mind, the question which we are then duty bound to ask is whose fantasy is this? Susan's or even the author's himself? After all, without intending to insult G.L. Davis's reputation, it has to be said that given the highly anonymous nature of this story, we are forced to take his word for it that Susan is even a real person, and not just a figment of his imagination. Just like we cannot be certain that the events are real, we cannot be certain Susan is either. It can be said that there are deep and distressing ethical issues regarding presenting a story that is as unsettling as this one as true without providing even a morsel of proof. Given that Davies claims to have seen Susan's personal research, scrapbooks and clippings of UFO and alien abduction cases, would it not have made sense for even a photograph of these to have been included in the book? Of course, maybe there is a good reason for it all, and Susan is real and did need to remain strictly anonymous. And in Davies' defence, in an interview dating to January 2019, in which he discussed this case with Dave Dominguez of the Paranormal Chronicles radio show, he did suggest that he was not necessarily 100% believing of Susan's story. I can't say if their, meaning people like Susan, accounts are real or not, he explained. Only that it's a sad world if this is all true. As for his motivation, there is no shame in pondering, discussing, talking, researching. And here, I must agree, with the caveat that this is only healthy if people fully question the testimonies that they are consuming. Do not mistake me, I dislike having to tear apart a case. I could have gone into more detail about this one, but I shall not. My point has been made. We are obligated to ask questions. I do believe the truth is out there and that it is an unpalatable truth, just not the one presented in this case, and that we will have to fight a lot harder than Susan ever did to find out precisely what it is. Thank you for watching, I truly hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing, being sure to click the bell icon to turn on all notifications for more of the paranormal. Equally, if you cannot wait until my next video, why not watch the one suggested on screen now? Until next time, 